We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Everybody awake and ready today? Everybody's not awake. Okay. We will wake up, so we're going to do some jumping jacks. If you're, if you're at home watching on, online, we're going to do some jumping jacks here in a second. No, we're not really. Uh, but hey, welcome to all of our guests, all of our first-time guests. If you've been here for a few times, uh, I'd just like to say thank you for continuing to come back. Uh, if you're watching online or in the lounge, please continue to do so and make sure that you get here to be in community with us as well. I hope you have an amazing time today. So, so far, worship has been incredible. How, do you agree with that? I believe that it was super powerful. Yeah, so I, if we have not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Mike Miller. I am the executive pastor of Worship Arts here at ACC, and I'd love to get a chance to meet with you at some point. Uh, but today, I believe that I have an assignment from the Lord to speak his message to you, not just some words that I put together or something, but it's something I've been praying about, and I believe that it's, it's his message to you. You know, we've been going through a series, uh, going starting with going through the book of Exodus, uh, and this series is called The Wander Years, and we are in part three. So let's jump right into the word. If you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter number three. If you don't have your Bibles, or if you don't own one, there is a Bible in the seat in front of you. Uh, that is yours. You can write in it, put your name in it. You can take it home with you if you need a Bible. I'm reading today from the NLT, the New Living Translation. That's the translation that we primarily use here at ACC. And to give you some context before we start reading in verse 5, to give you some context about it, Moses is led to the wilderness. That's what we see so far. And he, 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 is in, he, he goes to Mount Sinai. The Lord appears to him in a bush, and the bush is on fire. You remember that viral video, video that, went, that, that, video that went viral like I don't know, five, six years ago? I mean, more than that now. But that lady was like, the building caught on fire. She's being... And being interviewed by a news anchor, and, and she's like, the building is on fire. Y'all remember that? If you haven't, look it up. It's, it's hilarious, but that's what I think about whenever I uh, think about the bush being on fire. For some reason, I think of that lady going, the, the bush is on fire. But we're going to start reading in, in verse 5. So chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I? to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what's his name? Then what should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The title of my message today is Grumbling or Gratitude. Grumbling or Gratitude. Let's go to the Lord in prayer real quick. Holy Spirit, Father, we just ask that you would help us to not grumble. 
Help us to have a good attitude, an attitude of gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all we need right there. How many of you have, have caught yourself at time, from time to time uh, kind of like grumbling or complaining, and then you have to go to God and be like, God, I'm sorry, I feel bad about that. Or, or maybe you never go to God about it, and you're just, you just kind of have this guilty feeling after you've talked with your friends and you've been grumbling and complaining. Uh, I think it's human nature to do that, but uh, sometimes I think it's something that we can correct as well. But I want to backtrack for a second into the scripture we just read. If you go back to verse 8, you would see that God says he is going to deliver his people from Egypt and into the promised land. Right? And then down in verse 17, it's stated again. He says, from oppression in Egypt to the promised land. And then in chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, again, it says, from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. And then you can fast forward again into chapter 12, and it says that after 430 years, on the 430, the, the, the first, the last day, I'm sorry, the last day of the 430th year, the people were delivered from Egypt. And then in chapter 13, they're told to celebrate that day every month after they reach the promised land. All of this mention of these destinations, right? They, they talked about uh, being in Egypt, and then all of the different destinations that we read in that scripture in, in chapter 3, I want to point out to you that there's no mention of a destination called the wilderness. None at all. Not one time is it mentioned. Now, Moses went to the wilderness, and, and it says, the Bible says that he, he was at the wilderness, some, somewhere in between Egypt and the promised land. He went to different places, and he was in the wilderness, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that the wilderness was the destination for the people of Israel? You know, I've driven with my family probably, I don't know how many times now, many times from Texas to Maryland, from Maryland to Texas. And every time we drive it straight because we're like, we want to get from our starting point to our final destination as fast as possible. And so it's like 20, a couple of naps here and there for like in 30 minutes, an hour, something like that. It's like 27 hours. And so we drive it straight. We never stop other than gas and food. But on two occasions, we made some exceptions and we did stop. But the first time, we, on our way back, actually, we stopped at Bass Pro Shops. Because why not? It's the biggest Bass Pro Shops in the world. Right there in Memphis, right, on, right across the river. you got to stop there. It looks like a big pyramid. Have you all seen it before? If you haven't, Google it and then go. Because it's like, what, 12 hours from here? We should go. So uh, the second time, just now I'm thinking about Bass Pro Shops. Second time, we, we, uh, I got dragged into the wilderness on the way back from Texas one time, my wife brought me to Target, and we had 25 more hours to drive, and I just remember going through there like, oh, man, this feels like 430 years, and it was like crazy, and then, you know, just like Moses, I had a face-to-face -face encounter with God while we were there. Uh, what he told me, though, was shut up, smile, or it's a long drive, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> so that's what I did. I smiled, and I moved on. But from Egypt to the promised land, not once was a wilderness mentioned as one of the destinations. You remember what Moses did, right? He protested. He complained. He grumbled. He said, who am I to talk to Pharaoh? I, I can't approach him. I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. You think he'll talk to me? You, you think that I can lead the people of Israel? You think, that, you think I can bring the people of Israel from Egypt and out into freedom? And God said, in my translation, dude, I'll be with you. I'll be with you, and then I'll give you a sign, and when it's all said and done, you'll worship me right here once again. That's what he told them. Church, I'm here to tell you, you can't get out of being chosen by God. Once he's called you, he's called you, so you might as well move forward towards the destination that he's called you to and that he's put in front of you. And I also want to tell you this, that while you might be grumbling and complaining about the things that God has called you to, while you might be questioning your qualifications or your assignment from the Lord, God is saying, it's not about you anyways. It's about me getting the glory. And, and I'll be with you, and the one who has sent you is Yahweh. It's, it, it, the one who has sent you is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The one who sent you is, is it's me. It, it, I am who I am. I'm your GPS, your God's positioning system. That's what that means, by the way. Your GPS through your life, on your way to your destination. I am the answers when you're confused. I, I'm going to use you for my purpose and my purpose only. And that's what God is saying. So we, we know that Moses doubted his ability this entire time, right? He doubted his ability and his calling. Moses assumed that he wasn't qualified. Let's, let's flip over to Exodus chapter 13 
In chapter number 13, Exodus 13, verse 17, how many of you know that while God has always been and will always be consistent, he's a little unpredictable? I would say, I'd say his character is totally predictable because it's explained in here. But his, his actions are unpredictable. And I want to show you that in this scripture right here in Exodus 13, starting at verse 17. It says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them up along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with the battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. So God knew that just like Moses, the people were going to doubt him. They were going to grumble and complain. He, he knew that if they seen this army coming in front of them, and if, if this army challenges them to a battle, he knew that they would, rather than starting the journey to their destination, the promised land, they would turn and go the other way, and they would accept living in slavery. They would accept living in oppression. So he took them this roundabout way, this long way. He, he totally threw them off, totally unpredictable, right? He knew that the way to get them to trust him was that they had to be tested. He knew that if they had seen what was ahead, they would not trust him to get them to their destination, and they would start to desire what was in their past. So I want to ask you this question today. Do you only trust God with your past, or do you trust him with your future? Do you only trust God with your past, or do you trust him with your future? Do you only trust that, that do you only trust what God, uh, what you see and what is certain even if you, you can see clear as day that, that, that walking in that direction leads you back to slavery or, or oppression or depression or fear or anger or anxiety, all these different mental things, that, mental health things that we talk about, or do you trust, that, trust him in the things that you cannot see, even though God can? Do you trust him with what may seem impossible to you, with, with faith, would lead you to freedom, to victory, to joy, to eternity? Do you trust him in that way? In Exodus chapter 14, let's move right along. Pharaoh is pursuing Israel and, and chasing after them to take them back. Do you remember that part of the story? I believe you probably heard about it last, last week. But it says, in, starting in verse 10, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. And they cried out to the Lord and, and, and said to Moses, Why did you bring us here out, out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It is better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Talk about some imagery. But they grumbled. They complained. They cried out nothing but negativity, instead of having faith in the promise, instead of looking forward to where God was taking them, instead of looking at the final destination, instead of having gratitude for what God has done already and what he will do, they just grumbled. And then we continue to read, and Moses encourages them, and he tells them not to be afraid because God will rescue them and God will fight for them. And what happens next really just blows me away. If you really pay attention to the scriptures as you read it, you'll see that God brings the Israelites to the water before they get to the wilderness. How many of you know that God is the river of life? And the Bible says that if any of you are thirsty, go to him and drink. So he brings them to the water before the wilderness. But long story short, God uses Moses to split the Red Sea, and the Israelites walk across on dry land. The enemies are swallowed up by the water, right? And they, they, they turn and they watch their enemies get completely smashed by the, by the water but with the, at the mighty hand of Jesus. I think it's just the powerful, or the mighty hand of God, really. I think it's a powerful story to, uh, to read in the Bible. But the scriptures say that they were actually filled with awe, and they began to put their faith in the Lord again. And so I want to tell you something about the promised land and about the journey. You will never reach the promised land without a journey. You will never reach the promised land without a journey. You will always have the choice to exit the starting point, the starting destination, and to enter into the final destination. And what you do in that meantime, what you do between point A 
And point Z, it matters. Will you grumble or will you, about the hardships or will you have gratitude about what's ahead of you? Let me tell you the difference real quick about grumbling and gratitude. Grumbling guides you back to the gate of oppression. Gratitude guides you back or guides you to the gate of jubilation. Grumbling guides you back to the gate of oppression, and gratitude guides you to the gate of jubilation. So the, the Israelites, they start to finally catch on to this. And then in chapter 15, as they're catching on to this whole concept of, of oppression and jubilation between their grumbling and their gratitude, they start, they start, it starts in uh, chapter 15, it starts out with a song of deliverance that they sang. And they sang and they sang. None of it rhymed. Did you, have you ever read it? They didn't rhyme at all in the song, so it's not about rhyming, I guess. It's not even about how they sound, because that's not worship at all. But they sang, and they continued to sing, and they worshiped God. How many of you know that when you begin to worship God, Satan starts to tremble? He does. I, I, he hates hearing us speak the name of Jesus. He hates hearing us sing the name of Jesus. He hates hearing us worship him. He hates the idea of us being in awe of God. You know, when you worship, you remember the story of Paul and Silas. When you worship, mountains begin to shake, chains fall off, prison doors start to loose, start to break down, break free, you get loosened from those chains. That's what happened to Paul and Silas as they worshiped all night. And like I said, Satan hates the idea of you being in awe of God, so he attacks and then towards the end of chapter 15, when they're done singing, they arrive at a place called Mara, which means bitter. Have you ever tasted bitter melon? Have you ever heard of it? Is it an Asian-only thing? Oh. So I guess it's an Asian-only thing, but there's this thing called bitter melon, and I will not eat it because it's bitter. Um, it tastes gross. Uh, or maybe, uh, to put it in, maybe different, let's put it differently. So Mara means bitter, maybe like earwax would taste. Not that I've tasted earwax, on purpose at least. But the water at this place was bitter. It was gross. So once again, they looked away from God and they began to grumble again. And then in chapter 16, we read about God providing and the Israelites grumbling over and over again. We see the same story happening over and over again. The people are complaining as though they were testing God, and then God provides for them every single time. And after reading it a few times, I kind of figured it out. The Israelites must have been mostly or primarily or all women because they weren't just, they were, they're complaining about food. They, were, they weren't just hungry, they were hangry, right? The women get hangry in these Snickers bar or something. So I get hangry too, I'm joking. But throughout, throughout the text, you, you read that they are, they're complaining about food mostly because they were hungry, they are afraid of, of starving to death and the people thought they were going to starve to death. And so God provides something called manna. And I want to show you three things that manna represents in your life today. Point number one today is that manna represents the unexpected. Manna represents the unexpected. Unexpected things happen. They can be good. They can be bad sometimes. You just never know sometimes. But how many of you have like been, uh, you got an email or a message and it's like your boss or someone in your company saying, hey, I need you to come to this meeting and there's no other information about the meeting, and you're like, what is this about? You start to think, like, oh, man, what did I do? Did I, is it because I said that about him or her? Is it because I was complaining about this? Is it because I cussed this person out because they were taking too long at the water fountain or something? Like, I don't know. Like, you start to think different things, and you start to, like, worry. Uh, we ask things like, what do you want to meet about? Is there something I need to bring? Can I prepare for this or something? Is it, I, you try to dig, right, to, to get some more information so you know what to expect because the unexpected can be scary sometimes. Can you imagine the Israelites in slavery for 430 years, suddenly out on their own with this dude who doesn't even, doesn't even think highly of himself and has a speech impediment, if you remember from his story, but everything that they were up against at this point was a surprise at this point, right? They wandered and they were grumbling and God does the unexpected. I want to tell you today, if you are going to grumble, at least take David's advice about grumbling and complaining. Grumble to God. This is what he did. He grumbled to God a little bit. He complained to God and then he moved on. Because God is really the only safe space, if you think about it, to complain. Because human nature is to care for self before they care for others, right? God's nature doesn't fall in the same direction as that. God doesn't fall into that. This is what David says in Psalms 142, verses 1 through 3. He says, I cry out to the Lord, 
I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. And then if you scroll down or, or, or look down on your Bible to verse 7, David says, So I thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. So he is so overwhelmed that he complains. He grumbles to God for a bit, and then he shifts. He shifts his thinking from grumbling to gratitude. And I believe that we could all use that kind of shift in our lives at times. Manna represents the unexpected. Let's go back to Exodus in, in chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse 2. It says, There too the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. I, they wanted to die because they were hungry. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we want. But now we have, you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. So they, they literally expected to starve. They expected to die. And because of that, they preferred in that moment to be in slavery again. And so God answers and tells Moses this. He says, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you each day. The people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Whenever they expected to die from starvation, God provided for them more than they could ever imagine more than they could eat in that day. So manna represents the unexpected. It represents the time in your life when God's performance doesn't match your expectations. God's saying, look, I'm, I'm about to do the unexpected in your life. I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. I'm going to shake up your world and show you so much blessing that you won't be able to hold all of it. You won't be able to collect all of it. When you expect to be hungry, God is saying that I will provide for you and I will perform in a way that you would never expect more than you could ever ask or think. When you expect to be let down, God's performance says, I heard you and I'll be good to you. When you expect to be alone, God, God shows up and says, I'm with you. When you expect to be fired from the job, God's saying, I have bigger plans for you. But church, I want to tell you, I want to challenge you today to go to God with gratefulness for the unexpected instead of grumbling when the unexpected happens. Go to God with gratefulness for the unexpected instead of grumbling when the unexpected happens. When you go to God with gratefulness, it's like you're coming to God with your cup already full. And then anything that he blesses you with at that point, anything that he does that doesn't match your expectations, no longer has to fill you up from the bottom up, no longer has to fill you up from empty first but can now overflow in every area of your life. So when you're grateful, when, when you're grateful for when you where and when you started in your life, and you're grateful for the journey in between your starting point and the destination, you can expect that God will reward you in greater ways with abundance. Point number two today is that manna represents seasons of tests. Seasons of tests. How many of you remember back in grade school? where you, you're sitting in class and all of a sudden your teacher's like, hey, class, put away everything on your desk and just keep out a pen or a pencil. Then they start handing out scantrons or a blank sheet of paper and they're like, you're about to get a quiz. And some, you're sitting there thinking, like, when did they tell us about a quiz? They, I don't remember any of this. Maybe you weren't paying attention or maybe you were paying attention and you're that, that straight A student and you're sitting there, you're also surprised because it was a, a, an unexpected test. I always hated those moments in school. I do remember though, when I was in high school, for two years in a row, at two different schools, actually, with two different Spanish teachers, I managed to uh, get a past Spanish with A's both years because all, the teachers just somehow expected that I would just help them teach the other students Spanish. Now, I didn't know a lick of Spanish. I never have. It's not in my blood at all. And so um, I made it work. I don't know how. But I didn't have to take those quizzes. The other quizzes, though, were a little more tough. But being tested in the world may seem a bit harsh. I remember thinking in school that it was harsh when those pop quizzes came out. They're a bit uncomfortable, right? But let me tell you, being tested by God, it's like being tested with permission to open the book and look for the answers. God is saying, there's a pop quiz coming, but here's the answers. So trust me, obey me, follow me, and I'll show you the answers. 
and then he leads you to this book right here that all has all of the answers in it. And the Israelites had to go out daily, the Bible says. What we read was that the Israelites had to go out daily to gather what was needed. So God sent manna, right, to them to, daily, every single day, to teach them that they needed to rely on him daily. It's not like a one-and-done season of their life. It's a daily pursuit of, of what God has for them. It's a daily pursuit of God. Remember in verse 4, this is actually what it said. It said, each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they needed for that day. And I will test them in this to see whether or not they follow my instructions. And I dare to say that most of us in the room, if we knew a test was coming, we'd probably prepare for it a little bit, right? Some of us would over-prepare. Some of us would under-prepare. Some of us would forget about it and not prepare at all. But I'll tell you this. When I sat down and I began to think about this message and I, and I began to really think about uh, unexpected seasons of tests, just this whole concept of manna, this is what, I, it was what was revealed to me, that the course and quality of your life is going to be determined by your ability to handle what you didn't see coming. The, mil, the wilderness was not mentioned at all to Moses. The wilderness was a season of test, an unexpected season where, where they needed to rely on God for the answers and for the preparation for the test even. It was a stop along the way. It was not the journey it was not the destination, but it was a journey. And for you, for you to handle those kinds of seasons, you need to prepare for your life in every area possible. You need to prepare for those seasons of tests right now. The Israelites were not ready. Remember it said in, in chapter three or chapter 13, the Israelites were not ready for the short route, for the quick, obvious route. They weren't ready to go straight to the destination from their starting point. They had a lot to learn. So God took them through the wilderness, and they grumbled again every single time. I believe that there is a lesson in it that God was teaching them, and that is that the pause is just as necessary as the preparation. And I paused on purpose. The pause is just as necessary as the preparation. What do I mean by that? In Exodus 16, verses 9, what Moses had Aaron do something. He had told them to go to the people and tell them to present themselves before the Lord, for he has heard their complaining, right? And then it says that when they looked out towards the wilderness, they seen the Shekinah glory, the glory of God. The, the, the glory of the Lord, I'll tell you, it wasn't there for them to see because of their complaining and God responding to complaints and their grumbling it was there because they paused and presented themselves with gratitude because the Lord heard their cries. The pause is just as necessary as the preparation. Church, what will you do when you are faced with a test? Will you grumble or will you pause and praise him with a little bit of gratitude? You know, if we, if we would break ourselves of the habit of constant complaining and create a life centered around gratitude for what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do, we will experience the same Shekinah glory of God, the same glory of God that they experienced. After they paused with gratitude, the Bible says that quail flew in and, and, and covered the camp, and it says that a white flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. You remember that? It's not talking about bird poop, by the way. They ate the birds, they ate the quail, and the, the frost that was on the ground, that, that stuff was like coriander seed. And it was used, they collected that to make bread. Point number three today is manna represents God's provision. When you prepare for the test and you pause to praise, you can trust that God will provide. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse 21, and read from there. And it says, after this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its need. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. And on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. And then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. And he told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside for what is left for tomorrow. So I mentioned earlier about this white flaky substance that they were collecting, that it covered 
the ground every day, right? It was a, a, a daily thing. Uh, it was like coriander seed. The scripture says that, says that it tasted like honey wafers. It makes me think of uh, when you go to the store and you see like nature's own honey wheat bread, you know, things like that. They didn't get prepackaged loaves of bread like we would get. They didn't get to go to Mission Barbecue and get a, a pre-cooked, pre-baked corn roll, delicious cornbread. Uh, they didn't get a fresh five-minute life shelf roll from Texas Roadhouse like we would all probably want in about an hour. Oftentimes, I think that people tend to expect that God's promise should come without the journey, without any tests, without any hardships. The promised land should be right in front of us, right? As soon as we, as soon as we leave the destination that we, where we started. That's what people tend to think. Remember what I said earlier, though, the promised land doesn't come without a journey. You have to leave the starting line and walk through the journey to get to your destination, to get to the promise that's awaiting. So I have this thing here that I brought from home. It's called a mortar and pestle. You know, while on this journey, they had to go out every single day and pick up this flaky substance. I didn't put anything in here because I knew I would spill it. But while they were out there, what we see here in this story is that, that God's provision came to the people in the form of a project. They had to daily go out. They probably had a lot bigger mortars than this. But they had to go out and collect all of this seed. And they had to grind it. provision that God gave, the seeds of God's faithfulness, and turn it into whatever they needed. And it only lasted 24 hours, so they had to grind with gratitude daily. I think that's a lesson for us all, that we need to grind with gratitude daily. Also, I think that's a good shirt idea. So babe, write that down. Grind with gratitude. It's a daily thing. God will provide for your needs, but it's according to His riches not according to your needs, not according to your wants, not according to your desires. Remember Philippians 4.19, it says, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. You have to leave the starting point and move forward through the journey towards the promise. You have to move forward. So I want you to ask this question in your hearts and in your head right now. Just ask these three simple words. What now, God? Well, now, God, remember what I just said. You have to move forward through this journey. Guys, forward movement is not just attached to what you start doing. It's attached to what you stop doing. Many of us will, will go through our life, will go through our day-to-day -day knowing that there are things that we have to stop. In fact, I know a lot of people that would, that would say things like, I just, I have to be able to stop this before I can start over here. I have to be able to stop using drugs before I can start this. I have to be able to stop drinking alcohol before I can start going to church. I have to be able to stop looking at pornography before, before, for, before I can finally do what God has called me to do. I have to be able to stop cursing at people in traffic before I can finally start going to church and actually feeling like I'm accepted. But I'll tell you this, if you want to see forward movement in your life, if you want to see forward movement on this journey towards this destination that God has promised you, you can't wait for the stop to happen before you start. Forward movement is attached to you starting and it's attached to you stopping and the time is now. It's right now. The, 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 you might be thinking, but I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough of a person to be able to do this or to be able to start this. I, I have too much baggage to be able to follow Christ. I have too much debt to be able to start what he's called me to do. I have too many things going on in my life. Listen, you need to start to prepare right now. You need to start to, to, to move forward towards the things that God has called you to do regardless of that feeling. Because I want you to realize something real quick is that wherever there is preparation, there is pruning. And pruning can hurt. Those things that you feel like 
that, that are stopping you from starting what God has called you to do, you need to prune it. If you have too much baggage, prune it. If you have too much, too many things going on, too many, just whatever it is, pruning is painful, especially if you have to prune friends or family out of your life for you to be able to do what God's called you to do. Pruning is healthy, though, and it opens up room for more and more growth, and it nurtures life. And we see that it was after the Israelites stopped grumbling and started to give thanks is that they they moved forward and got to see and experience the glory of God. And I'll tell you, God provided for the Israelites then. And in the same way, I'll tell you right now that he will provide for you now. And he will always provide for you. And I believe it's our jobs to prepare, to pause, and to praise. It's our jobs to leave this gate of oppression and run forward toward the gate of jubilation. It's our jobs to raise the banner high and go to war against the enemy. You know, it says in Exodus 17 that we we read that the, the Israelites defeated, actually God defeated for the Israelites, their enemy. And so they rose a banner high and it said Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. And anytime that you feel like you are in a test, God wants you to know that he is your strength, that he is right beside you. He is protecting you. He is fighting for you. Anytime that you feel the pressures of life and you feel like the walls are closing in on you, God wants you to know that he loves you. He's showing you the steps and he's holding you up as you move forward. Anytime you feel like you are in a battle in your life, God wants you to raise your banner high and begin to praise him because you can be confident knowing that the battle is already won. You can be confident that victory is yours. So raise your banner. Raise your banner. Praise Him. When you are up against life and you're in this journey in your life in the wilderness, I want you to take, this is your what now. If, if you turn to the back of your note sheet, you can write this down. There's three things that I want you to take. Is that when you are in this journey, in your wilderness, take time to prepare, pause, and then praise wilderness is like a reset button almost it, it, the wilderness is the place for you to prepare pause and praise it's not a place where you're lost and you're you're uh, just kind of wandering going I, I don't see God it's a time for you to prepare to pause and to praise you know we talked a lot about manna from the book of Exodus today if there was a fourth point to my message today I would tell you that the fourth point is this is that manna represents Jesus Manna represents Jesus. Jesus says this in John 6. He says, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so in this story in Exodus that we read through, it proves to us human nature, really, is that our nature is to want God to provide more so that we need him less. But Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, and you can only get to the Father through me. So prepare for the journey by spending time in his word daily. Pause and talk to God. Pause and wait on him. Pause and call on him to move and work his miracles in your life. He is a God of miracles. Pause and rest the way that God instructed the Israelites to rest on the seventh day. And then praise him with gratitude through worship for who he is, for what he's done, for what he is doing, and for what he will do. Remember this before you leave today. Remember this, that grumbling guides you back to the gate of oppression. Gratitude guides you back or guides you to the gate of jubilation. It's time that we choose gratitude over grumbling, to choose victory over slavery, to choose jubilation over oppression. So I want you to do me a favor, stand to your feet. We're going to sing one more song together. And I want you to worship this song, sing this song to the Lord with gratitude. So we're going to forget about this grumbling now. We're going to do what David says. We got the grumbling out of the way, and now we're going to worship him. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this.
you belong at ACC.